Bugs. No one likes them and there are 10 quintillion of them in the world. They are small, nasty and they get everywhere. Bugs in code are the same way. Time to explain why they occur and how to exterminate them if they do. I'll be using Lua and the Love framework for illustration purposes, but this will mostly apply no matter what you are using. There are two kinds of bugs that you can run into. Syntax errors and logic errors. A syntax error is what you get when your program fails to execute. In love, you are greeted by a scary-looking blue screen of sadness containing unintelligible gibberish in an ancient lost language that actually is relatively easy to understand if you don't freak out and close it down. Most of the information can be ignored, and the error message will usually do a very good job of explaining why and where in your code the error exists. Let's take a couple of examples. If we read the second row, it says syntax error main.lua7, meaning the error is in our main file on line 7. Next, it states that an equal sign was expected near 40. If I open up the code that triggered this error and look on line 7, we can see that there indeed should be an equal sign between the variable player with and the value 40. Let's look at another example. Here we can see that once again the error is in the main file. On line 27 it says that an end was expected. Let's look at the code. At first glance that can seem like an odd statement. Why would it expect an end down here? What does it think this is? Game of Thrones Season 8? The clue is in the next piece of information that the error message gave us. In parentheses it says to close function at line 17. If we inspect the function that was declared at line 17, we can see that there is no end statement. If we type end at line 19 and rerun the program, you can see that it no longer crashes. Had we not read the whole message and just blindly followed what it first said, and typed end at line 27, we would have created a ton of new problems. Because now our awesome code function believes that the following two functions, player.takeDamage and love.draw, should be inside of it. Luckily for us, in this case we would get another syntax error if we run the program. Because love.load is trying to call player.takeDamage, which has not been declared yet since it is inside of the awesome code function. Imagine we did not call player.takeDamage in love.load. Then we would be able to run the program, making it seem that everything is working as it should. That would be an incorrect assumption, as you would be ambushed by the second type of error, the sneaky logic error. All of a sudden, the player's health is no longer being printed. Just because your code is syntactically correct, doesn't mean that it will do what you want. These kinds of errors are a lot more annoying, because you won't get any help from an error message. After dealing with enough logic errors, you will learn to love syntax errors, as they tell you exactly what they want and don't play hard to get. Errors, bugs and crashes will always happen, no matter how experienced you are or how good you are at programming. That said, there are good practices you can get in the habit of that would reduce the amount of issues you run into. At the top of the list is good code structure. A very basic thing is to always indent your code properly. This makes it a lot easier for you to spot syntax errors, such as a missed end to close off a function. If something is inside of another thing, like a variable inside of a function, or a table inside of a table, and a table is inside of that table, and that table contains another it should be indented. Most people use spaces to indent, but there are a lot of people who prefer to use tabs. Which practice is best is a debate as old as time, and there are a lot of arguments in both directions. You should use whatever you feel works best, as long as you pick tabs. Tabs were designed for indentation, and allow developers to view the same code with their own preferred indentation, without having to change anything. <coughs> code repetition. If you find yourself writing the same thing over and over, and you find yourself writing the same thing over and over... Wait a minute... Aha, uh, let me just... If you find yourself writing the same thing over and over, you are creating a lot of code repetition. This is bad for several reasons. On top of making your code longer and harder to maintain, 
it opens it up to logic errors when you want to change functionality. Imagine that you have a player that can deal damage to enemies in multiple different ways. Every time the player deals damage, you set the enemy's health to be equal to the current health, minus a number. Now imagine that you want to implement additional functionality later down the line. For example, you want enemies to flash red when they take damage. You'd need to add the functionality at multiple different places. And chances are that you miss a spot and have now introduced a bug to your game. Bug meet game, game meet bug. Ugh, we don't want that. The solution is to use functions. In the given example, you could create a take damage function that takes the amount as an argument and then call the function. Not only does this reduce the size of your code, it allows you to implement that new feature you wanted everywhere by adding it in one place and one place only. Speaking of functions, they're great, but do come with their own set of challenges and trapdoors. A common mistake is to have large functions that do too many things. How many things are too many things? The boring answer is, it depends, but generally anything over one. The moment your function does more than one thing, it introduces a bunch of problems. The most obvious problem is that a larger function has more code, so it takes more time to read, understand and use said function. On top of that, multiple purpose functions are more niche and therefore harder to reuse in different situations. Imagine you were in charge of programming a roller coaster. Thinking you'd save time, you create a function called slowdown that slows the ride down and releases the buckles for the seats, intended for the end of the ride. So far so good. After a lot of work and many rounds of testing, you want to make the ride more exciting and decide to make the ride stop over a drop. You see your fancy function called slow down, that you mostly don't remember writing at this point, and decide to reuse it here. The ride gets to the drop, slows down for a quick break and... For the ones paying attention at home, that probably wasn't the desired result. Anyways, it also has to do with complexity. If the code inside of a function is really simple, for example initializing a bunch of variables, then there is less reason to break it up. Meanwhile a much smaller function that is incredibly complex would benefit a lot from being broken into smaller, easier to understand components. Large and complex functions are also more difficult to give good names. The naming of variables and functions is something that might seem like an obvious and easy thing to do. But there are books upon books written about this subject. This is because naming is a skill that you can always get better at. My general philosophy is that it is better to have longer and more descriptive names, especially if you intend them to populate the global namespace. In a small loop, it's perfectly acceptable to use one-letter variables, because it's usually very obvious what they do. Remember the roller coaster example? You should. A lot of lives were lost that day. The problem was not entirely due to the fact that the function did multiple things. It was also named poorly. Had it been named something more descriptive, such as slow down, release passengers, it would have been less likely that it got used incorrectly. When you name variables and functions, you should follow the established naming conventions for the language. Lua doesn't have rules as strict as some other languages, but at the very least you should stay consistent. Personally, I start normal variables and functions with a small letter and use camel casing for each new word. I use all caps for constants and separate each word with an underscore. When it comes to class names, for example player, I start them with a capital letter and use camel casing, for example player backpack or unit manager. As a complement to good names, you can reduce the risk of forgetting what variables are used for, what different functions do and how your code works in general by using comments. It's a great way to leave a message to another programmer or yourself in the future, but be aware that comments are not to be used as a substitute for clean code and good naming conventions. I have seen people write short, nondescript code accompanied with massive comments explaining what it is and what it does. This often ends up taking more space than just using longer, more descriptive code. It also takes longer to understand code if you need to decipher it using comments. Speaking of comments, be sure to leave one on this video. I read all comments and really appreciate all feedback.
believe it or not, but a lot of common issues that many beginners encounter stem from forgetting to save their code. I have seen multiple threads on the Love forums where a person has asked for help, only to realize that the issue was that they had forgotten to save before running their program. I remember I had this happen to me a lot in the beginning as well. It's just not a fun feeling when you realize that you've spent an hour trying to figure out why your game isn't working, only to find out that you forgot to save. When you are coding anything, you should run your program all the time. The moment you finish writing something, you should immediately test that it A boots up and B does what you intended. If you instead continue on and implement more stuff, the amount of errors will start piling up. The more errors you have, the harder it will be to find and fix them, especially if they are errors you created a long time ago. Your goal should always be to keep your project in a state where it can start without crashing, because if your game fails to execute, then you won't be able to test for logic errors. Playtesting and playing are two entirely different processes. As opposed to when you play your game for fun, playtesting is the art of breaking the game before it breaks you. Think of everything that a player would and wouldn't do in your game, and then try to do it all in every possible way, multiple times. Then do it again. I'm serious, if you can't break your game, you aren't trying hard enough. This isn't supposed to be fun. How much testing is required depends largely on the complexity of the project you are trying to break. Printing values to the console is a key part of this as well, as it can allow you to spot logic errors. For example, you can print the health of an enemy, the damage dealt by the player, and the new health of the enemy that was hit. Then you can validate that the math checks out. If you think you are good at playtesting, you need to be humbled by your friends and family. I guarantee that they will ruin everything and do nothing right, which is exactly what you need. They do not have a preconception of how the game is supposed to be played. This increases the likelihood of them finding something that you did not even consider to test. A great way of finding the causes for your bugs is called rubber duck debugging. Basically, you need to buy a rubber duck, place it facing the monitor and ask it to please find them. Well, that won't work because the duck does not know how your code works, so you need to explain it. That's the actual basis of rubber duck debugging. The process of explaining everything, even the stuff that you think is obvious and totally not the cause of the problem, to this inanimate object. In the process of doing so, more often than not you will stumble upon the issue, which you otherwise just glossed over. You may have experienced this already. You asked someone for help and in the process of explaining what you need help with, you find the solution yourself. It's a great way of debugging and a trusty rubber duck should be in every programmer's arsenal. If you are having trouble getting something to work, what should you do? The first thing you should do is seek out relevant documentation. What documentation you need depends on the problems you are having. On a more general, low level, you can find solutions to your Lua programming issues and questions in the Lua online documentation. If you instead wonder how a love specific module or function works, your best place to look is over at the love to d Wikipedia. This is a great way to familiarize yourself with all of the features that are available. Let's take love.graphics.rectangle as an example. We can find that function by clicking on the love.graphics module on the left side. Here you can see everything that is included in the module, and here is the rectangle drawing function. Every function page will have a synopsis that will summarize it. The synopsis is fairly straightforward, and usually it's easy to understand what arguments we need to pass in. However, for the parameters that are not obvious, for example the mode argument, we can look right below for more detailed instructions. If we click the first argument, we find out that it expects one of two constants. Fill in order to draw a filled shape, or line in order to just draw the outline of the shape. This is how you navigate the wiki. It might seem intimidating at first glance, but everything follows the same structure. A lot of issues that you may be experiencing are very likely to have also happened to someone else. So it's a great idea to search the Love Forums, Support and Development section. When all else fails, it's time to bring in the heavy artillery and ask for help on the interwebs. When I started out, I was afraid of asking questions that I assumed were super obvious and that it would make people think that I'm just a big dum-dum. That is obviously not the case. 
I have helped so many beginners with all kinds of issues and there are really no dumb questions, so don't be afraid to ask. However, there are poorly formulated questions that will result in you not getting any answer. And that's what we will focus on now. How to properly ask for help, be it on the forums, Discord channels, or while talking to someone you know. Here are some do's and don'ts when it comes to asking for help. Do provide all the relevant information. This includes what you want to do, what your problem is, and any code related to your issue. Don't copy-paste the error message and assume that someone will be able to help you. Error messages let you know where the issue is located in your code, but without access to your code it's very difficult to know what the problem is. Do check if a similar question has been posted first. The answer might already exist. Don't ask vague questions. A question like, how do I make my player able to shoot enemies in my top-down game, is an example of a terrible question. That is in fact many small questions baked into one large question. What you should do is split this into each small component. To continue with the player shooting example, it contains steps such as getting the angle between the center of the player and the mouse position, creating a bullet when the mouse button is pressed, calculating the x and y velocity for the bullet from the angle and the speed, moving the bullet's x and y position based on the x and y velocity, Checking for collision between bullets and enemies. Resolving collision between bullets and enemies. Now that you have split up the original question into as many sub-questions as you can, you should go ahead and try to solve as many of the steps as you can. Then, when you reach a point where you don't know how to do a specific thing, let's say calculating the x and y velocity for your bullet, then you can go ahead and create a post asking that specific question. If you do this, you increase the odds of someone wanting to help you out astronomically, because it shows that you put some effort into it yourself and don't just expect someone else to do it for you. Do mark your posts with solved when you or someone else solves the problem, and post the solution that solved your issue. This will help other people in the future who have a similar issue. If you made it this far, chances are that you enjoyed the video. And the easiest way to help YouTube know that is by giving it a like. So go ahead and click it a click. You might as well subscribe while you're at it. There are way more tutorials and informative videos coming soon. Goodbye! Camel casing, camel casing, camel casing.